sermon on this powerful, powerful series that started last week, Agents of Change. And today, I want you to go ahead and stand, take your, get, get uh, on your feet now, praise the Lord, and get your Bibles real quickly. Powerful. What are, the young people are so creative, huh? Young people are so creative. They, they bring flavor to everything we do. And, uh, and we love our young people. In fact, we're going to be praying for them uh, right at the end of the service because tomorrow, I believe tomorrow, they go, they're all going to go to the youth convention that they have in L.A. And uh, they're going to be having a great, great time there. Praise the Lord. So we're going to be praying for our young people. But if you go to Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13 through 16. Praise the Lord. When you have it, say, I got it. The Bible says here in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 through 16, it says, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trample underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Father, we thank you this morning, Lord, and everything that has transpired already, Lord, has really touched our lives. And so this morning, God, just help me to be able to convey what you are placed in my heart, Lord, so that we can remain salt on this earth and be those agents of change that you call us to be as a church, as your people. Father, we thank you and bless you. I pray for every heart and every mind here now that they will stay attentive and focused to what you want to say to us today. Father, we love you and thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody says amen and amen and amen. You may be seated here this morning. Praise the Lord. I was... Uh, Thank you for this awesome video that was put together. And of course, there was a lot of my friends that throughout the years uh, we have worked together. And uh, um, uh, you know what I was thinking there as, I, as I've seen all these individuals? I would have never, ever, I would have never met these individuals that you saw on the video outside of Christ and coming to the Lord. All of those friends that talked about, you know, you're my friend, been, you know, we've known each other, we work together and all that. If I would have kept the life that I was living, I would have never met these individuals. And so um, I was just looking at that and I was able to see how God is able to not only change a person's life, but also change everything that they do. Amen. All of my friends are completely, you know, um, different. I would have never known them if it wasn't for what Jesus did in my life and in theirs as well. Praise the Lord. Here in this portion of scripture that is found in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 through 16, Jesus defines his church as being salt and being light in this world. And I want to talk to you a little bit on that because he says that we are the salt of the earth. We are the salt of the earth. I want to give you a couple of things that I believe that salt is or is used for and how Jesus is comparing your life and mine, the life of the church, with salt. Salt, first of all, it preserves. If you want to look at that, salt preserves. A preservative is a substance used to keep food from decomposition. In other words, salt is used to keep food good. Hello, somebody. Jesus is speaking to the original disciples. Remember that. He's speaking to the original disciples, many of whom were fishermen in the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus is speaking to them, 
And he knows that the way that they kept the fish from spoiling when they were able to transport the fish from one side to the other or from one sea to the next, from one town to the next, he knew that they would put salt on the fish to be able to keep the fish from spoiling. So Jesus speaks to them and says, I want you to know that you are the salt of the earth. He knew that he was giving a clear message to his disciples on who they were and what they were supposed to be. What Jesus was really saying is very clear to all of us today. Jesus was implying to his disciples that there is a moral decay in this world, that this world is rotting out with sin, and that they needed to be the salt on the earth to be able to keep the entire world from going down downhill because of the message of the gospel that was inside of them. You see, despite today, despite the fact that man has greatly increased in his knowledge of science, medicine, and technology, man is totally incapable of changing the basic sinful nature of this world. Man can, you know, excel in all these different things of knowledge and science, medicine, and technology. But man and man's knowledge can never change man's heart. It is, it is something that only God and only our creator and only the gospel and the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ is able to change in an individual's life. As you look at the world today, in fact, I was speaking with Pastor James just yesterday, I think it was, and we were talking a little bit in that he is going to be coming here to Santa Rosa with his children for, he's going to be here for a few months. He's going to get his children and, and establish his children, and uh, I believe uh, his daughter is going to begin to, uh, she's going to start attending the, the JC. She's going to be going to college coming up real soon, and Pastor James James wants to come and be a part of that and establish everything. He's going to come and get them a house. Come on now. He's going to come and do everything he needs to do with his family, with his children for a few months. And then he's going to go back. But I want to let you know that we were talking about Cape Town. And Cape Town, I believe, is the number eight or number nine city, the worst, the most violent city in the whole world today. And I want to let you know that there is need everywhere in the world today because of sin and violence. Violence is all over the world. You see different countries and even in our cities, in our nation, and you're able to see the violence and the killings and the murders that are taking place all throughout. Things are escalating even more. You hear about war taking place and all these parts of the world, greed and people with money. In fact, I get sick to my stomach when I see and when I watch TV, especially the news, and they're able to bring out some ugly sin that is taking place throughout the world. I saw the other day about this rich man who, who's got so much money and yet he is in there and he's probably going to spend the rest of his life in prison for sexual perversion in his life. Taking little children and having camps and, and, and kidnapping kids all over. And these are yeah, individuals who have so much money. If money was the answer, this wouldn't be happening. But it's not money and education and knowledge and technology. And all those things fall well short of being the answer to this world's problem and sin. But Jesus is telling the disciples, you are the salt of the earth. You are somebody that if you keep the gospel and message of hope inside of your life, you are able to influence the world for good. You're able, just like salt, be a preservative for this world. See, no matter how much men's knowledge improves, the Bible clearly tells that the men's moral depravity will continue to grow worse and worse until the day of God's judgment that comes upon this world. That's what the world, that's what the Bible tells us. And this is the truth. Second Timothy 
chapter 4, 1 through 4, 1 through 4, Paul gives a serious charge to a young minister, a disciple of his, Timothy. He says, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. I give you this charge. Preach the word of God. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to please their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from truth and turn them to myths. See, what, the, what he's saying right there years ago, it's happening today. If you look at our world today, if you look at even some many ministries that, that were so focused on soul winning and preaching the gospel, somehow they have watered down the gospel just so that they can gain multitudes of people. Just for the gaining of money or resources or whatever it may be. There's so many places that are compromising the gospel today and they have thousands of people. But I want to let you know that the Apostle Paul saw this thing coming and told Timothy, look, as a young minister of the gospel, do not compromise this message of hope because what this world needs, they don't need the money. They don't need this other stuff. What they need is the word of God, the uncompromised word of God being preached and understanding to another level. See, my friend, the cities of the world that are all escalating in violence, what they need is the gospel of Jesus Christ the message of hope and salvation and love and grace that is able to be given to us by our Savior. Come on now if you know that we are the salt of the world, the salt of the earth to be able to minister to all in Jesus' name. Come on, give the Lord a good praise. Give the Lord a good praise. Hallelujah. The time is coming, he says, when people will not put up with sound doctrine. They're not going to like the truth. They're not going to put up with sound doctrine and the truth. Instead, they're going to gather around teachers and find places that they tell them what they want to hear. And then they will congregate there. Compromising the true message of hope and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now you wonder, you and I wonder, why has God... Why hasn't God already destroyed this world with all this sin and all the madness? Why has he put up with men's sinfulness this long? You wonder that. I wonder that sometimes. But then there's a couple of reasons for that. And that's found, of course, in the word of God. In 2 Peter 3, 9, first of all, he's waiting for some of you to get saved. Come on now. He's waiting for some of you to get saved. Some of you that are not saved. Some of the ones that are outside of these walls. And they don't know Jesus. God loves them so much that he's waiting for them to get saved. Second Peter 3 9 says. The Lord is not slow about keeping his promises. As some people think that he is. In fact God is patient. Because he wants everyone to turn from sin. And no one to be lost. You know why he's waiting? He's, he hasn't came and, and, and destroy everything and stop everything. Do you know why? He's waiting for some people that are not saved to get saved. His love is so great that says, no, there's too many people that are going to end up away from me, apart from me for eternity. I'm going to wait. I got to wait. I got to wait. He waits for people to give their lives to him. I thank God that he waited and he included me into getting into his kingdom and getting saved. Come on now. How many thank God that he didn't come before we got saved? Hallelujah. He's 
his grace was extended to your life and to my life. And he's extending it to those who have neglected to step out, to cross the line, and to surrender to the loving arms of Jesus Christ. So that's one reason. But the second reason is because spirit, listen to this, spirit-filled Christians are holding back evil from taking over. Oh, Jesus. Spirit-filled Christians are holding back evil from taking over. In 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 7, the Bible says, the mysterious wickedness or evil is already at work. Yes, we see it at work. But what is going to happen will not happen until the one who holds it back, until the one that holds what back? That evil spirit. What's going to happen is not going to happen, will not happen, until the one who holds the spirit back is taken out of the way. Now what is the Bible talking about here? I want to let you know what the Bible is talking about. The Bible is making reference to the great day when we as a church, as a Holy Ghost filled Christians, we are reunited with Christ. When the rapture takes over, when the rapture takes place, rather, see, God will come and take his people who are filled with the Holy Spirit. How many know that when you accept Jesus, God places the Holy Spirit inside of you and you become the temple of the Holy Spirit? Remember that? We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. When you truly accept Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, the Holy Spirit is deposited inside of you. And he stays inside of you. But there will be a time, and the time is coming, hear me and hear me clear. The time is coming when Jesus is going to come to take his church home. And when the church is taken home, since the Holy Spirit is not just flying around, the Holy Spirit is inside Christians. The minute that the Christians are taken from here, the Holy Spirit is taken also, is moved out of the way. And when there's no Holy Spirit, and when there's no Holy Ghost Christians on this planet anymore, and the Holy Spirit is taken away, then all of a sudden, evil is going to move forward as never seen before. There's going to be madness like never seen before. You think you've seen some violence. You, seen the, you think you've seen some wickedness around the world. This is nothing in comparison what will happen when the Holy Spirit is removed out of the way, when Christians Christians are moved out of the way. There's going to be evil everywhere. In the streets, in the houses, everywhere you see evil at all. Because the Holy Spirit will be out of the way. What is the Bible saying? You know what the Bible is saying? Holy Ghost Christians, people who are filled with the Holy Spirit, are holding back evil from taking over. If you and I were not here, if the Word of God was not here, if the Holy Spirit wasn't here, all these madness that are people that are trying to break lines to destroy everything that's been created in the image of God will be destroyed but this is where God is going to come and bring judgment and God loves us so much that he's saying I will not bring judgment on this world until I take my people until I pull the Holy Spirit and then evil will come wrath will come upon this world so if you're not saved today you better get saved you better get saved because we don't know when this is going to begin. Come on, somebody need to give him a good praise. Some of you that like to play Christianity, this is not time to play. It's not time to play. Jesus is saying, I'm not coming yet. Because I love those that are lost and bound and suffering and pain and in sin. I love them so much. I'm giving them more time to get saved. I'm giving more time. And I'm not pulling my Christians out of there yet because they are the salt of this earth. If the unsaved people, if our unsaved children, if our unsaved family members, if our unsaved co workers have a chance, it's because you and I as Christians are right there. And God's saying, I'm entrusting you. You are the salt of the earth. Don't let everything die. Bring it back 
to life. You're the one who's keeping it from going all the way down because everywhere that you go, you are to influence people. You are to influence places because you are the salt of the earth. Come on, somebody need to give them a good praise. We are the salt of the earth. You see, my friend, salt is a preservative. We are the salt of the earth, he says. We are keeping the world from rotting away. Hello? Because of the Holy Spirit's presence in us and our presence in this world. The moral decay of the world is being restrained by the good, by the gospel, by the truth that we share, that we preach, that we live everywhere we go. You see, my friend, salt salt in a salt shaker doesn't do any good I'm going to say that again salt in a salt shaker doesn't do any good it is only when salt is sprinkled out of the salt shaker that it can fulfill its purpose of flavoring or pres preserving food it's the only way when he comes out, this is the salt shaker right here. Hallelujah. We're all inside. Glory to God. Salt shakers right here. Well, guess what? We can give a high five and we can do all that. And maybe some of you that are not saved, maybe, you know, we influence you here. But I want to let you know that the real influence takes place when the salt shaker, when the salt comes out of the salt shaker and we go all over, all over our city, everywhere that we go, then we're influencing, we're supposed to influence everywhere we go. Come on, you can give the Lord a good praise. You can give the Lord a good praise. Come on now. We will be coming out in a good 30, 40 minutes out of here. And God says, you're the salt everywhere you go. You're the salt of the world. Huh? It is only when we leave the salt shaker and go into our communities, in our neighborhoods, our places of work, our schools, and places of business and restaurants, and among non-Christian friends and relatives that we truly make a difference as the salt of the earth. Only then we can make a difference. And then Jesus poses a question in verse 13 there of the same uh, 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 books. And he says, but if the salt loses its flavor, how can it be salty again? Right? He poses that question. Of course, you, you, you can't. See, salt can sit in a container for years and years and never lose its flavor. It'll stay salt no matter what. But it is only when salt is mixed with something else that it loses its saltiness or its distinctiveness. Salt remains salt no matter what as long as it stays pure. But once it's mixed with another component, then it's not salt anymore. It's not good anymore. John MacArthur writes about this and he says, The church cannot accept the world's self-centeredness, easy solutions, immorality, and materialism. We are called to minister to the world while being separated from its standards and its ways. Sadly, however, he says, the church today is more influenced by the world than the world is influenced by the church. It's a sad statement that sometimes the unchurched, the ungodly, that the world, it, see, it influences people in the church more than the church influences the world. This is a sad commentary. But here in Victory Army Santa Rosa, we want to do everything we can possibly do to be able to not only preach, but to live the truth so that we can continue to influence our community and our world and our city wherever we may go. Jesus calls us the salt of the earth because he wants us not only to, to influence the world, but to know that the reason why evil is not running to its full capacity and level is because Christians are still in the house. Come on now. Christians are still in this world. Come on. Sold out people for God are still in the world. Holy Ghost Christians, Holy Ghost filled Christians are still on this planet. And as long as we're here, 
We're holding back what the devil and evil really want to do. Brothers and sisters, listen carefully. When the world can, cannot see any difference between our lies and theirs, they will categorize us as hypocrites and imposters. We will lose our witness and effectiveness in the world when we are doing and acting and talking the same as they are. We're here in church, but on Friday or Saturday, we're at a nightclub. Hello, somebody. No, 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 no. This is not how God wants us to, to be. This is not what God wants us to do. This is a person that, that, that lost its saltiness. No more salt. They have lost it. How can they regain it? The only way that they can regain it is to empty the salt shaker. Empty the salt shaker. Move all that aside and put brand new salt inside. And don't mix it again. What does that mean? That whatever that salt was mixed with has to be do away with, done away with, get it out of the way and put pure salt one more time in that shaker. Come on now. How can we bring this home? Let go of the things that you are touching. Let go of the things that you get involved in. Let go of the things that are killing your influence as a Christian. So the Bible is talking about because God has called us to be salt in this world, to influence, to be agents of change in this world, to influence the world for God's honor and God's glory. Secondly, a salty Christian, listen, a salty Christian is a ther thermostat Christian and not a thermometer Christian. Come on now. A salty Christian is a thermostat Christian and not a thermometer Christian. Matthew 5.13, he says, you are the salt of the earth. You are. Now, a thermometer. What is a thermometer? It's an instrument for determining temperature. You determine the temperature with this instrument. It is a fine tube of glass with a number scale and containing a liquid that rises and falls with changes of temperature. Hello? You put that thermometer in a room and then the thing starts changing according to the temperature that is in that room. That is a thermometer. It measures the temperature that is existing. But a thermostat, on the other hand, is an automatic device for regulating temperature. Oh, come on now. The level of temperature in a room is determined by the thermostat. The thermometer adapts to the temperature that is in the room, while the thermostat changes the temperature of the room. Come on now. And God is saying to all of us, I don't want you to be a thermometer Christian. I want you to be a thermostat Christian. That everywhere that you go, you set the standards. Come on now. You set the temperature. You set the temperature. You're an influencer. You are to influence for my honor and glory. Lord don't let them set the standard. You set the standards everywhere that you go. I called you to be the salt of the earth. And you are to make a difference everywhere you go around the world. Come on. Somebody need to give them a good praise. I remember when I got saved. When I first got saved, I lived in the city of Oakland. San Leandro area. My whole family lived in Oakland, in East Oakland. And I remember that when I got saved, and I remember my brother was real deep in crack cocaine and all that madness that was running over there in Oakland big time. I got saved, man. God changed my life. It was a miracle. I had an encounter with Jesus, and he just took everything away from me. He was so awesome. I got delivered like this. And I remember that my brother and my, my, my mom was a little sick at the time. And I knew where they hang out. I knew the house that everybody was at every week and every day. And I remember my mom was getting a little sick. And I, I said, I, go, I gotta go find my brother. So I went 
to that house and there was all kinds of homies there and they were doing their stuff and they got tables with lines of coke and they were doing this on this side and doing that on that side. Knocked on the door, they opened the, and, and they, you know, I was able to come in and they start offering me, you know, to drink or, hey, you want a line and all this. I was able to minister to all of them and I told them, no, I'm here, uh, where's my brother? I know my brother's here somewhere. And they say, he's, he's in the back room. So I went, he's smoking crack. He's, he's uh, you know, he don't want to listen to anything. I remember it was so sad. And I came to the room, them and, and all that, and I shared the gospel with them. And I remember I prayed for them. They allowed me to pray and all that. I remember I left. My mother was in the hospital. She was almost dying, and my brother ain't coming home. And I remember I got to go get my brother. And I remember going in a, a dark place in Oakland in this house. And I knocked on the door. And when I knocked on the door the second time, the second time I've been at that house, after I've been saved, they open the door and homie says, hey, just hold up a second. And then he turns around and he tells everybody, put the stuff away. Pelone is here. They used to call me Pelone. Hello, somebody. <laughs> homie Pelone is here. Put the stuff away. And I remember he let me in and guys are getting the mirrors with, with stuff and putting it away and everything like that because I came into the room and I looked at all my homies and, and I started sharing the gospel with them. I went in the back and I remember getting my brother and I almost had to, you know, turn, turn crazy on him, you know. My mom was in the hospital. You don't want to come. He's doing his thing. You coming with me, man. You're coming with me. My mom ain't going like that without seeing her son. You got to come. I remember he was all, you know, crazy and everything. But I took him. But I remember I stopped on my way out and I talked to the homies. And I was able to lay hands on some of them. And the drugs were out of the way because they had this kind of respect. Everywhere that they seen me after that. Everywhere that they seen me. They have respect for me. Don't say that. Don't talk like that in front of homies. Me. I said, don't worry about it. That's where I come from. But they have respect. Why? Because they knew oh, I was real. I was real. I told them, I'm not here to get a joint and smoke with you. I'm not here to do another line. I'm not here to live my life like that. I'm not. And I'm not fake. I wasn't fake when I was with you. And I'm not going to fake. I'm not going to be fake running with God. I made a decision. God touched my life. He is real. He is alive. And I'm going to run for Jesus. Jesus for the rest of my life and they respected me after that a thermostat Christian don't do what others do thermostat Christian you bring the standards up to another level I'm not going to be compromising here and there because my homie because my son because my daughter because of this ah this is not how we play it this is not how we play it we may love our children. We may go the extra mile. We may do all these different things. We do not compromise the gospel. We do not. Because eventually, if there's any hope for your children, they're going to look to you and say, man, that man, that woman, my mom, my dad, they stood for this thing. No matter what, they loved us, they cared for us, but they never compromised the message of hope. They will respect you more. Come on, somebody need to give them a good praise. Some of our children who in sin, and there's some ugly sin out there. I got to say to you from the bottom of my heart, that because your son or your daughter become a drug addict, it doesn't mean that drugs are okay now because he's your son. Oh, no, 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 no. No, you love your son. You talk to your son. You pray for your son. You fast for your son. There's some things that don't happen in my house. There's some things that don't happen when I see you. I don't want to ever see you like that in front of me. You, you get rid of that. I'm going to throw it away. I'm going to break it. I'm going to do something. That stuff is killing you. Drugs are no good at all. It's evil. Don't matter what, I love you. Come to my house. This is your place. This is your house. This is your, your family. No problem. But you can't you can do those things like that. In my presence, you cannot do that in my house. You can't. Period. 
I love you. I pray with you. I go, let's go eat. Do whatever you got to do. I get some clothes. I buy you clothes if I have the money. I go the extra mile. I pray. I fast. I do whatever I got to do. But don't ask me to compromise this thing. Because you are a drug addict. I'm not going to say, oh, drugs are okay. I don't want anybody telling my son that he's in sin. Yeah, he is. He's in sin. He's a drug addict. Need to change. Need to accept Jesus. Need to do something. And if you wouldn't stop drugs, if you wouldn't stop saying that drugs is a sin and all that, you, your boy, your, 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 your daughter were not born like that with drugs. Something that came about in this sick world. Now let me bring it home. If your daughter, if your son are playing around with homosexuality, love your son. Love your daughter. Go the extra mile. Pray for them. Fast for them. Love them. But don't you ever stop. Don't you ever agree with them and say, it's okay. It's not okay. It is said not because I say it. The book says it. The Bible says it. There's hope, son. There's hope, daughter. I know you're in trouble. I know you're confused. But get out. God says, that's sin. I love you. I go the extra mile. I die for you. But my son, my daughter, that's still sin no matter what. You can change me whole. You can change. Sometimes we, 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 we change, we do these things. Be careful, Christians. So you're not in agreement with all that stuff. They're lost. They're confused. They need love. They need all these things. But they need the truth more than anything else. They need the truth. I see some of you, like here on Facebook, and oh, how cute. How cute when a guy is with another guy. How cute. How cute. Tell him the truth. Tell him the truth. That's what they need. Oh, I haven't seen you for a while. How cute. No, how cute. Nothing. You can say, I haven't seen you for a while. And then separately, individually. Hey, come on. I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you that you will find true change in your life. I'm praying for you. You go in the wrong direction. I care for you so much. I haven't seen you for a long time, but you're in sin. I need you to come out of there. God loves you. God wants to deliver you. God wants to change your life. That's what they need. The last thing that we want is for a church that allows everyone to go to hell and do nothing about it. But saying how cute. It's not how cute. This is the gospel being preached. That's what the apostle Paul was saying. Hey, the day is coming, Timothy. When people are going to want to sit down in places that, hey, tell me what I want to hear. Instead of speaking the truth. You yeah, got to know the truth. You got to know the truth. This is what the world needs. This is what many churches need. Compromising. So they can get people. Ah, not here, not in Victoria, Santa Rosa. We go to the truth. We love. We love everybody, even the sinful people. We love them. We love the homosexuals. We love the drug addicts. We love the prostitutes. We love them. But it's not that we are going to compromise and say that their sin is okay. It's not. God wants to change their lives. God wants to deliver them. God wants to set them free in the same way that you and I were set free from other kind of sin. God wants to deliver them as well. Come on, somebody need to give them a good praise. Thermometer, not a thermo, not a thermostat. I mean, thermostat, not thermometer. We are to bring change. He said, but his salt loses its flavor. How can it be made salty again? He cannot lose his flavor unless it's mixed with something else. Like mixing salt and pepper. Hello, somebody. It's no longer just salt. Salt and sugar. Hello. Have you, have you guys had salt and sugar get mixed? It tastes pretty cool. I tried it before, but it doesn't taste like salt anymore. It's not pure salt anymore. And Jesus was telling the disciples, I need you to stay salt. Don't allow yourself to get mixed up 
with the other kinds of stuff that this world wants to give you. Don't get mixed up with that. You lose your saltiness. You will not be influential anymore. Salt, my friend, also cleanses and heals. Hello? Salt cleanses and heals. And, he and, and, and heals as well. Salt, listen to this. Salt is a miracle as you and I are a miracle as well. He said, what? See, did you know that salt is a miracle? Salt is made up of two poisons. Salt is made up of two poisons. Number one is chloride, chloride or chloride and sodium. If you digest either one of these two, you will die. This is a fact. It's a fact. If you digest either one of these two, you die. But when they are mixed together, come on now, when they are mixed together and become common ordinary salt, then it brings life, it brings good to the whole world. Salt is a miracle. Just like you and I are a miracle. You see, the enemy and sin has affected your life so much that the devil, the devil tried to, try to mess you up so much that you will not bring anything good to this world because of sin in your life. And then another thing that took place that it was really bad is the death of Jesus Christ. When you look at Jesus and he died on the cross, it's like, wow, that was a tragedy. And you look at it. But when you mix that tragedy oh, geez, with, your, with your life, a sinful life, when you mix it together, the grace of God on that cross, when he died and rose again with you and I as sinful people, then it brings life and salvation to every one of us and we become the salt of the earth because something bad was turned into something good. Come on now. Somebody need to give him a good praise. Maybe that's the reason why Jesus says you are the salt of the earth. You are a miracle. You were destined to die. You were destined to be in your sin. You were destined. But because of my death on the cross and mixing it with you, my grace is sufficient. I will not only save you, but I will use your life to be the salt of the earth. And you will give a message of hope to the entire world. Come on, somebody need to give them a good praise. We are a miracle of God. We are the salt of the earth. Salt cleanses and salt heals. Also, the next one is the salt flavors. It brings flavor. Salt brings fla flavor to our food. And I wrote on there, life has no true meaning without Christ. L life has no true meaning without Christ. I've, uh, you know, I've, I've been in many different places. I've been in different levels in my, in my, in my Christian walk and and even economically, I've been, I've been, you know, like, I, I, I don't care at the beginning. I don't care about anything. Money, finances, resources. I came over here. I had nothing. Came over here. We didn't have insurance. I little, little kids, uh, Joey, and we had children. We didn't have insurance. We were going to the clinic. We didn't have money. We didn't have anything. We came over here. So I, I've been there. Before I came to the Lord, I, I was, I was, you know, years and years ago, I was terrible, like, like, real poor, in the neighborhood, messed up. And now, throughout the years, God has blessed me a little bit more and stuff like that, where my bills are paid. Hello, somebody. My bills are paid. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. That's a miracle. Jesus performs miracles. He allows you to pay your bills. Some of you are saying, oh, pastor, come on. Ah, if you live where I lived, you know it's a miracle. But I, 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 you know, like that, you can pay your bills and have a couple dollars in, in the bank. Hello, somebody. Come on, you pay your bills and you got a couple dollars in the bank. Hello, somebody. And then you start looking at everything and then you say, What is money? What is money? Is it really able to provide happiness and joy and purpose? And you look at it long enough and you say, you know what? Money, 
Money is empty. Money doesn't doesn't really it that, that, that doesn't doesn't have true meaning. Or you can buy true meaning with money. If you have money, or you can buy a vacation and you can go and do things. Yes. But after you come back and sit down for a minute, you got to go again because it didn't fulfill anything. And you got to do it again and again and again and again. You got the money, keep on, keep on, keep on. But when you sit down for a minute and you look at everything, this don't bring true meaning in your life. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. That's why the richest person in the planet, it was Solomon. Remember Solomon had everything? And he says, I built everything, I gained everything, I bought cattle and properties, and I built every building I wanted to build. And at the end of the day, I, I sat down and I wept and I said, life is empty. How can it be empty? You got everything. Because some people that chase after money and chase after this and lose happiness and lose family and lose relationships and lose their relationship with God and lose everything, chasing after something and chasing after something, only to get to the end of that and find out it's empty. Is empty. I'm going to let you know that God has a plan for your life and my life. And this plan doesn't say run after this and run after that and try to make it over here. He says that he's sufficient to bring us fulfillment and happiness and joy. Salt gives flavor. This has to do with a certain winning attitude in your life that God gives you by the power of his Holy Spirit. This certain attitude, a winning attitude is established because you know him, because you know Jesus, because you know the scripture. You know that you are not alone no matter what. Hello, somebody. Begin to feel meaning in your life because you know I'm not alone. Ever since I started walking with Jesus, I'm not alone anymore. I don't have to deal with my situations in life alone anymore. He is with me and I know it. How do I know it? Because I know Jesus. You begin to understand that you're not alone, that God is with you. True meaning begins to come about in your life because of knowing that Jesus is with you every step of the way. You begin to understand that there's something good even in the storms of life. Hello. You begin to understand that there's something good even in the storms of life. And I must find the good in all the storms of life. Every situation that you go through, there's something good that if you start looking for it, you'll find something good in it. But a lot of people close their eyes and they begin to become negative about everything. And Jesus is saying, I want you to be the salt of the earth. That means keep a winning attitude. No matter what happens, let your co-workers see you go through something and when they look at you have a good attitude don't matter what because you know that sooner or later God is going to come through for you because you know God there's something good even in the storms of life and I must find it God works all things together for the good the Bible says you begin to understand that that you may be going through something tough but you know that God's about to come through again for you you begin to understand that there is a lesson in every situation of life and you must learn to grow through it. There's a lesson in every situation of life. When you go through a situation, God wants to teach you something to make you better so that you'll be better tomorrow. You'll be stronger tomorrow. Your faith will grow through the situation. You will learn some lessons that he's trying to teach us to make us better. To get us to the next level. To give us a better life. You must go through something. But God teaches you lessons through it all. To make you a better man. A better woman. For his honor and glory. And you know that there's a solution in every situation in your life. And you have to look for those solutions. Because God will give you solutions in every situation of your life. It may take a little while. You may require a miracle. You may have to make some wise decisions, but there is a solution in everything that you go through when you are walking with God. That's the reason why you keep a good attitude. It's a winning attitude. And this is what brings to others hope that, only, that they can only find in Jesus. I'm almost done here. I just realized how, how it is 12 o'clock. Hello, somebody. All these presentations, you know, my message is real short now. No, I'm just kidding. Amen. 
Let me give you this and I'm done, okay? Salt irritates. Salt irritates. How many know that salt irritates? If you had a cut or something and you put, ah, what happened? That little white little thing, man, it just burns. Yep, it irritates. Here in 2 Timothy 4, 2 and 3, he says, preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instructions. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine anymore. Instead, to please their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. You see, Christianity, my friend, and the truth and Christianity robs many people the wrong way. Because it's irritating. Hello, somebody. It's irritating to their wounds of sin. They don't want to hear it. Ah, don't tell me that. Don't tell me that. What are you talking about? I don't want to hear that. See, we, should, we shouldn't purposefully try to irritate people. <laughs> but at the same time, don't be surprised when it happens. When you are living the truth, when you're preaching the truth, when you walk in the truth, all the people are going to get aguitado, agit agitated. Hello, somebody. <laughs> hey, hey they, 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 they're going to be like, oh, it hurts, it burns. Stop talking like that. Why you got to preach about that? It hurts. Well, yeah, salt irritates, but, but salt heals at the same time. Oh, come on. It may not feel good. It may burn a little bit. But if we pay attention, we will start getting healed with the salt, with the word of God that God has given us, my friend. Don't run away from the truth. Allow that truth to heal you up. Come on, give the Lord a good praise. I want the worship team to come. I want you to stand to your feet and let me give you this takeaway. You can take this from this message. You can take this. This is the question. Listen, listen. If we're going to go home right now, just keep this. Keep this. This is, the, this is the important part of the whole message here. Okay? How do I remain salt? Because that's the key. How do I remain salt in this world that's trying to take away every single bit of saltiness that I have in my life. How do I, how do I keep the salt in my life to keep on influencing this world for Jesus, for good? How, what do I do? How do I remain salt? Number one, listen, simple, simple. Number one, as you go home, find a daily time and place to meet with God. Find a daily time and place to meet with God. I don't know your schedule. I don't know your routine. I don't know, you know, the uh, hours when you go to work. Or I don't know any other stuff, but you do. Look in the time of the day. What, what time is a good time to get those 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 20 minutes to meet with God? And you want to remain sold. We want to remain sold, right? We want to remain sold. We don't want to be like the world. Come on, God saved us. God chose us. God, God pulled us out of madness so that we can help them. We want to help them. We want to help the, the lost. We want to reach people. Find a daily time and place to meet with God. Why is this important? Because if somehow you're losing your conviction... Sometimes things are a little blurry like that and we begin to make decisions or begin to talk in a certain way, hug in a certain way. If you meet with God daily, He will waken up your convictions. He will wake up the convictions inside of you where you begin, hey, wait a minute, I need to repent about that. This ain't right. I can't believe that I'm beginning to do this or talk like that or say that. When you meet with God, your convictions remain fresh and alive in your life. Godly convictions, that is. Godly convictions. That's why meeting with God daily is important. It's very important to remain salt. So find a daily time and place to meet with God. Secondly, read His Word regularly. Read the Bible regularly. Maybe right before you go to bed. 
Make it, make it a, a, a habit of yours that when right before you go to bed, open your Bible and read a chapter. Read a few verses. It's okay. You can read it. Your mind begins to change. There's peace that comes about when you read the Word of God. Hope and encouragement in God's promises are found in the Word of God. When you read it, there's hope that comes inside of you. Like, he promised you something, the Word of God brings it back up and says, hey, stay focused. Because those promises are still coming your way. They're still alive. They're coming your way. Read the Word of God. And thirdly, practice consistency in church attendance. Practice consistency in church attendance. I learned that early on in my Christian walk. If you practice consistency in church attendance, this is what happens. When you're coming to church regularly, that leads to participation in the church. You keep on coming, it helps you to participate in witnessing. All of a sudden, you begin to believe and begin to get to another level where I got to tell somebody else. When you come to church regularly and you hear the word of God, you feel like you want to tell somebody else, your family, your friends, people out there. You may even go and evangelize to the street corner like we do. As you begin to come regularly, you begin to participate in tithing. You take a step and you say, hey, wait a minute, this is my church. This is my church. This is a movement. We're doing things. We're, we're getting to, 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 to influence other people who are lost. And I'm part of that. I'm going to go ahead and be a part of it. I want to be obedient to tithing and, and contributing to the financial support of the ministry. You're a part of it. You don't talk no more like their church. You talk about my church. This is my church. You participate in tithing and serving. Serving. You get involved in serving in ministry. And you begin to impact your community, your family, others for God's kingdom. And let me, let me tell you what you find when you begin to operate at this level. And the young people said it earlier. You begin to live a life that is fun with purpose. Fun with purpose. You're looking for purpose? You're looking for real purpose? Stay obedient to the word of God. Get involved in doing something for God with your gifts and your ability. And you watch. You be a person that is so, you have so much joy in your life. Because you're right at the center of God's will for your life. Father, we thank you. And we bless you, Lord, that you have called us to be the salt of the earth. Thank you, Father. Thank you for including us in this awesome calling of yours. Father, we pray for your people right now. Touch every heart and every mind right now. That we would all, God, make a decision and cross the line to remain salt. Salt in this world because it's needed. In the name of Jesus. Let me give you this altar call and this challenge. Just like the Apostle Paul told Timothy. Timothy, don't compromise the truth. Speak the truth. Correction and rebuke and instruction with patience and love. If it's you today here and you said I needed to be challenged today to remain focused, to keep my convictions pure in the presence of God. I want to continue to live for God. If it's you today, maybe you was facing some temptation, maybe some things, maybe some friends, maybe at work, maybe other places that all oh, they were showing you or talking to you in a certain way. Maybe you were compromising a little bit. I want you to get out of your seat. I want you to come if you decide to stay pure. Listen, I want to make a difference for God. I want to make a difference in my family. I want to make a difference in the kingdom of God. I want to make a difference at work and everywhere that I go. If it's you today and say, yeah, I want to be the pure soul. Then get out of your seat as we, as we sing this song. Hello, come on, come on, come on. Yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. Come so that I can pray for you. I want to pray for you. Overwhelmed by the weight of sin. Jesus is calling
Yeah.